The US have numbers. Dempsey's missed it. Donovan has it. It's London Donovan. The past 25 years have been a wonderful journey, both for me personally and for the sport of football in my country. Going to Switzerland and being part of the 2022 bid was a bizarre experience. And for a 28-year-old kid who was so naive to that world, it was fascinating. I was thrilled to be there, giving that presentation to the Exco members, and naively thought it would matter. Looking down and seeing people sleeping, not paying attention on their phones, did make me think it was a foregone conclusion, right? People had already made up their minds. At the beginning, the Russian bird doesn't seem to have had much interest from Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin is not a football fan compared with, for example, his passion involved in, say, ice hockey. But of course, eventually, Putin realized that this was a prestige project for Russia, that it required winning basically all costs for political reasons. There was intelligence that there had been a dialogue going on between Russia and Qatar, not natural bedfellows. But at the end of the day, both have strong energy interests, both have interests in the Middle East. And that opened up the potential for there to be some kind of trade-off. Sources on the England team had gathered intelligence about a vote swap, which the Russian team had allegedly done with Qatar. If you get your voters to back my bid, I'll get my voters to back your bid. And that this whole thing had been sewn up around a big bilateral oil deal in which Qatar agreed to invest billions and billions of dollars in developing the oil fields of the Yamal Peninsula. It's an incredibly difficult place to prospect for oil, but it's incredibly rich in its supply. And so it was in both countries' interests. What we could then see in our own documents was that Bin Haman played a key role in brokering those meetings. He had hosted the Russian bid team and the Russian energy minister on a trip to Doha at which this deal was allegedly discussed. The Yamal Peninsula deal, I think, says it all. This is how the operation was conducted and the sort of assets that Russia and Qatar brought to bear. If you can host a tournament, it's a glue that sort of increases the popularity of unstable authoritarian governments. And I think that was part of this equation and still is. A World Cup does not produce money for the country. The country has to expend a lot of money for the World Cup. The economy, naturally, will take some money by tourists and so on. But uh, it is not an economic matter, but it's a prestigious matter. Michel Platini, the former French footballing superstar and FIFA executive committee member, had previously pledged his support to the American bid. But he came under increasing pressure from Nicolas Sarkozy, the then French president, to switch his support to Qatar. And that was because Sarkozy was eyeing a number of major deals with Qatar. He was keen that Qatar buy up and bail out his favorite football team, Paris Saint-Germain, which was hemorrhaging money financially and a big deal by which Qatar Airways would buy up 50 planes from Airbus, the French company. And one week before the decision, I got a phone call from Michel Platini. And he told me, something has happened. Now you will be in difficulties. He was the president of UEFA at that time. And he told me that he was asked that uh, his group should vote for Qatar and four votes, they go to Qatar. Then it was impossible for US to win. Platini lost courage. He should have said to the president, no, we're going to, to do something for the world and not something only for one country. The 222 FIFA World Cup is Qatar. <laughs> I think it was the biggest accomplishment of, of, of the history of Qatar, in my opinion. It was a super accomplishment for, for Bin Hammam. Everybody in Qatar knows what Mohammed Bin Hammam has done for football and for the FIFA World Cup. Bin Hammam was an absolute hero. He was kind of almost a god in his own country for the work he did. Bin Hammam's victory took Blatter by surprise. 
And when Bin Hammam did it by securing such widespread support across the continent of Africa in particular, which is really the heartland of Blatter's own base, that was a real threat to Blatter. You know, he knew that Bin Hammam had long harbored ambitions to go for the FIFA presidency. And very soon after the, the World Cup decision, he started maneuvering against Bin Hammam in pretty overt ways. Blatter came out and announced unilaterally that he was instituting a new anti-corruption committee to oversee FIFA to look at the World Cup bids. Now we have these independent bodies and we have to follow uh, what they are going to find out. It became clear to Bin Hammam that in order to protect Qatar's World Cup bid, he needed to be the man in charge of world football. And so that was really what spurred him to launch his own campaign for the FIFA presidency in 2011. Mohammed bin Hamam, although once a close ally of Blatter, is now calling for change. This is actually maybe one of the weaknesses of FIFA today. He's been there too long. Too long, uh, 13, 13 years as a president. Let us open the window for fresh air to come. Parliament was looking into England's failed bid. And as a result of that, they did a call for evidence. And so we submitted all the evidence that we had picked up from you know, the six consultants and from the two FIFA Exco members. FIFA is not corrupt, definitely not. I think that Sepp Blatter is a diabolic genius. She was there in Angola. And had she given evidences or not? Have she evidences? I don't know, I don't know. The one man who many thought could possibly beat Set Blatter to the top job in world football with draws. Mohammed bin Hamam of Qatar says he won't stand for FIFA president. Bin Hamam's decision to drop out at the 11th hour of the presidential race was kind of a mystery to his many supporters. The prospect that he might defeat Blatter in the election was really the only leverage he actually still held to protect Qatar's World Cup bid. But the answer to why Bin Hammam suddenly resigned was disclosed to us when we received a phone call from a source in Zurich who was someone who was very close to both Mohammed Bin Hammam and had been very close to Sepp Blatter. He found Blatter sitting there with a very senior member of the Qatari royal family and was informed that a deal had been done between Blatter and the Qatari royal. If Mohammed bin Hammam bowed out gracefully from the FIFA presidential race, Blatter would ensure that the Qatar World Cup would come to no harm, that the tournament would go ahead. And if this story is correct, and I have no reason to doubt on, on the words of Mohammed bin Hammam, then they shook hands, deal was done. It was he who had secured Blatter his first victory in 1998 as FIFA president, his re-election in 2002, and who had pulled out all the stops to achieve the seemingly impossible feat of winning the rights to host the World Cup for his own royal family. And to see these two figures uniting against him was a devastating blow. And worse still, he was told that he was to retire home to Doha and really never to speak publicly about any of what had occurred. He was silenced. This was a really key moment at which Blatter showed the full extent of his power as a kind of mob boss at the top of the organization who is able to cut deals and use alliances to end someone else's career and secure his own fortunes. Mohammed bin Hammam says that you made a deal to let the Qataris keep the cup in exchange for bin Hammam dropping out of the presidential race. Not at all. This is. Uh... This is the first time I heard about that, but not at all. I, and, and I wouldn't enter into such, such an arrangement. Definitely not. President Joseph Blatter. Sepp Blatter has been re-elected. Blatter won another four-year term as head of soccer's governing body. There is not one single doubt that the World Cup 2022 will be organized in Qatar. I just remember what a very prominent member of the Qatar organizing committee told me. I said, we play the rules of FIFA. You have to blame FIFA and not the countries. Neither Russia nor Qatar. They had no choice. They want the World Cup. They have to play the FIFA rules. The FIFA rules are dirty. So where is the problem? It's with FIFA. FIFA is a business. It's an institution, but there are people behind the institution. And it's really important to remember that people can be corrupt. 
people can be bad. People can make bad decisions. And when that happens, it can turn really ugly really fast. The decision makers, most of them never played the game, never felt the game like the fan is doing. That is the issue that a lot of us players, coaches have with those that run the business side of things, you know, that kills you. So that Blatter and the members of his executive committee really treated FIFA like their own personal fiefdom. They behave as though the game belongs to them and they can do with it whatever they want to enrich themselves and to further their own advantage. And they do that without really any regard for the hundreds of millions of people who genuinely love football and actually care about the game. There's a well-known phrase in football, which is the beautiful game. The beautiful game is the wonderful thing of watching Pelé or Johan Cruyff or those great players who played in the World Cups. But this was the ugly game. This was the football administrators. This was the corrupt deals behind those football matches. Sepp Blatter said the British media's latest wave of allegations about Qatar was motivated by racism. If corruption allegations against Qatar's bid are proved, should there be a revolt? Just, but listen, just, no, no, let sorry. me, let me answer, okay. let me answer. I am not a prophet, that's all. So we wait the results and we will see what will happen. There was a whitewash and basically FIFA was doing what it always did, which was to avoid engaging with the corruption at its heart. It was frustrating, it was intensely frustrating. We couldn't get FIFA to take this thing seriously, and Sepp Blatter remained in place as president of FIFA despite presiding over this complete charade. It felt like we'd failed at forcing a change, but what we didn't know was that all the time we had thought it was up to us, the FBI were investigating, and the whole FIFA house of cards was about to come crashing down. Until you have somebody involved in the conspiracy, explain to you what is going on, the case will not break open. People always said, oh, FIFA's like a mob and gangsters and stuff, but I never thought of Chuck as that, but I guess he was. We were opening up the tip of a big old iceberg. It is a monumental takedown. This is the biggest sports bust in history. Discovery.